Good evening. Welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and answering your questions tonight, social analyst Eva Cox, who wants a stronger civil society in Australia. Businessman Mark Carnegie, who this week used the Wheeler Centre's gribble argument to call for compulsory civilian conscription. Youth advocate Holly Ransom, the co-chair of the G20 Youth Summit. Businessman Tony Shepherd, who led the Abbott government's National Commission of Audit. And a former Labor leader, Mark Latham, who's turned his back on parliamentary party politics. Please welcome our panel. Thank you. And Q&A is simulcast on ABC News 24 and News Radio. You can join the Twitter conversation by using the Quanda hashtag. And remember, if you have a live question, add at Quanda to help us find it. Well, tonight, as we promised, we'll be looking at the big issues facing Australia. First, let's do uh, deal with some breaking news, the sentencing of Australian journalist Peter Grester for seven years in Egypt. Our first question comes from Keisha Grau. How do you think the Australian government will respond to the imprisonment of Peter Greste, socially and politically? Tony, let's start with you. I mean, it was a, it was a profound shock, I think, for most oh, people who yeah. heard that verdict. It was just appalling. Uh, we were sort of all hopeful that common sense would prevail. But here's an honest journalist going about his job, reporting the news, and he ends up jailed for seven years. I mean, it's just remarkable. I'm sure our government will get behind all sorts of pressure to put on the Egyptian government to have him released and uh, hopefully our good friends in the United States who have a stronger link with Egypt uh, will, will also... Well, that is a good point, influence. isn't it? Because they are supplying billions of dollars uh, to the Egyptian military. So Correct. they do have a bit of a whip hand there. They do, they do. Mark, and... Sorry, I'll, no, please go ahead if you want to finish that. Well, I was just saying, I mean, they are a country that prides themselves on free speech and journalistic freedom, so... That would be quite consistent with US values. Mark Latham. Well, it's a straightforward task of diplomatic pressure, using every avenue available to uh, try and get this man some justice. Uh, he's been convicted of publishing false news. If we did that in Australia, we'd have hardly any journalists out in the street free. <laughs> so we can't have this happening, can we? So um, they need to apply the diplomatic pressure and uh, do the best job they can in what is obviously a very difficult circumstance. Holly Ransom. Yeah, I completely agree. I think the comments that have been made, um, we need to do everything we can. This this situation is, is devastating. I think everyone's shocked at the decision, particularly the gravity, I think, of the sentence that's been laid down. And as Mark's mentioned, I think using every avenue we can to bring justice and working with our diplomatic colleagues, particularly in, in the US, will be necessary to do so. It's strange, isn't it? I mean, we... we sort of knew uh, it could happen, but I think the, the shock of actually seeing injustice at this level has actually really affected people. Absolutely. I don't think it's surprising. I mean, obviously, um, freedom of expression, freedom of the press is something we value extremely highly in this country, and to see it thwarted in such a, a severe manner and to see an Australian at the bear the brunt of that is really quite tough. Eva Cox. Well, I think it's absolutely appalling, like everybody else, but it's also interesting that there were two other people with him that were also convicted, and I think mm. we've got to look at it in the context of what's happening within, you know, the whole Egyptian idea of sort of pride, of sense of politics and so on, and hope maybe they've got a new president that he might be prepared to be compassionate and mm. to be able to do something and to try and be adept at recognising that this is part of a much bigger picture. It's, you know, it's appalling for Mark Grester but it's part of a really complicated games and things that are being played within the Middle East on a whole lot of levels and make sure that we don't put our feet wrongly into the, into the mess. One suggestion briefly that perhaps the Australian government should be asking the Attorney General of Egypt to review the case with some urgency. Well, I think, yes, that and an appeal for clemency to the, to the new president who can shine and look as though he's perfectly reasonable since he's no longer an army general, he's now at the head of a government. You know, I think there's lots of ways that you can actually deal with this that needs to sort of feed into a really complex diplomatic situation. Mark Carnegie, um, I think the questioner asked how, how the government is going to deal with it socially as well as politically, and I suppose it is a question as to whether there will be a backlash in Australia. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing is it's profoundly sad for him, his family, the other journalists, as Eva said, but also you've got to feel profoundly sad about the hopes of the Arab Spring mm -hmm. getting crashed upon the rocks so quickly. There was a flower, a hope, a moment in time where you really thought there was going to be democratic progress. Mm. And then you see something as brutalising as this. You just have to be saddened for that society. 
OK, look, I think we needed to respond uh, to that. There's not a lot. Oh, actually, I've got a question from the floor. We'll quickly go to you. Go ahead, sir. Yes, uh, I, I find it uh, strange that we're not, also not dealing with the, all the people that are on death row over there right now that are really in the, in the sights of the government mm -hmm. and we're not standing up for them too because this is a, this is a major problem in, in the world and, and what's happening over there, especially in Egypt. Yeah, we'll take problem. that as a comment. Can we, can we, can I, so, can I, yes, can you can. Say Mark, that in Australia, generally, we make very poor use of our former Prime Ministers and there are other countries where, in similar circumstances, they would send a former national leader, uh, in this case to Egypt, as a special emissary, to, to, to plead the case and seek reviews and the like. And uh, it just strikes me as an instance where a Paul Keating, a John Howard, a Bob Hawke could play a useful role bringing a special status to Australia's appeal on behalf of Grester and uh, it, it might get a better result than just sending dipl mm. diplomatic cables. Yeah, Tony Shepard, what do you think about that? It would require, it would require the government to sort of put yeah. aside... Uh, yeah, well, they could, could send John Howard, of course. They wouldn't yeah. have to uh, no, go bipartisan route. I, I think it's a good idea. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. It, they've got status. They're recognised in Australia and they're recognised internationally, I, I think that's not a, a silly mm. idea at all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we will... I'm sorry, we'll take your uh, point as a comment about the death sentences because it's uh, horrifying enough mm. to contemplate it. But we are going to move on to the issues that we came here to talk about tonight. The next question is from Connor Werrett. Um, it's clear that most of Australia is disappointed with Parliament as a whole. Uh, should we explore new systems of democracy and reform our government? Or is the status quo that we have now still the most effective way of dealing with the issues of the nation? Mark Carnegie, let's start with you. Well, I certainly think that we've got to explore other ways of um, thinking about democracy. I think the silent majority of Australia feel incredibly disillusioned and disengaged. And I think with all the changes in technology, there are an enormous number of ways that you can actually get more people engaged. And all I'd say is, having been to sort of summits and other things that are meant to be taking the great and the good to get them together to find some way forward, I've, I would, all I would say to you is, anything that we try is likely to have a better chance than what we're doing at the moment. You've uh, specifically talked about creating <laughs> forums for citizens to engage yeah. in policy yeah. debate in much the same way that the Athenians used to bring together people yep. to sort of judge issues and uh, pass judgment on what should happen. Yeah, so, I mean, there's a guy at Stanford who's devoted his life to this about trying to find some way to engage in citizen forums, make yeah. the, you know, as I say, the democratic centre, the silent majority, actually spend enough time to get on top of the issues to think about what to do. And I just remember going to an infrastructure New South Wales sub um, summit where somebody got up at the end and said, look, we all know what to do with $2 billion of infrastructure spending in New South Wales. We all know that it's made up of two, three and four million dollars small investments, incremental high social return investments. But instead, what we know the politicians want is hero projects and ribbons to cut. And we're never going to get improvement in infrastructure until we find some way to get more people on the ground thinking about us, how to spend it. And then you look at the tax summit, we all turned up, everybody gets into their corner, lobs, you know, grenades at each other and goes home and says they've tried. We all know still to this day we need tax reform, but last I saw, not much had happened. Well, that's partly because the government ignored the major fine. <laughs> Well, and, you know, they would claim they couldn't do it because it was dead on arrival from a political point of view with a hung parliament, and everybody's got an excuse, mate. Let's bring uh, other players in. Tony Shepherd, the idea of more democracy. I think we've got too much democracy at the moment. I think we spend half the time contemplating our navel and not getting on with the job. What we need is political leadership, Tony. I, I, I mean, you can debate these issues forever. You know, fundamentally, our democratic system has served us very well. One of the reasons we are one of the most prosperous and peaceful countries in the world is that our democracy fundamentally works. It well, you and your improve. auditors did get quite a big say. Uh, yeah. I suppose there's a feeling that perhaps there should be a more broader community say in what happens in the country. Well, I think you've got elections. We've got three levels of government. We have more elections than probably any other Western democracy. We've got more politicians probably than any other Western democracy on a per capita basis. I mean, I think we're pretty well represented. I think everything's ventilated. We've got incredibly free media, including the ABC. 
I think there's very little that's undisclosed in Australia, and I think people are generally very well informed. So I think they're in so fact. You don't, I think you don't, you don't think a, a, a sort of Athenian-style citizen forums, well, we'll never looking get, at issues and voting. We'll on never them. get anything done, Tony. We'll never get in. I was, I was thinking uh, back the other day, we were looking at the uh, Opera House, I was thinking, 1956, and we're deciding what will we build at Benelong Point. And we've got three designs. We've got Utzon's beautiful design. We've got some Greco-Roman uh, you know, manufactured concept and a block concrete thing from, the, from London, basically. Which one would a Citizens Forum pick? I, they wouldn't have picked Utzon's, I'm telling you now. At the time, at the time you're right. But, they wouldn't uh, have picked it. I'm a 56 child, I'm telling you, they wouldn't have picked it. Mm. So you need leadership. Yep, but I also think there's, you know, Connor, to your point, like I think there's a great opportunity to engage people more broadly in making decisions. I don't think we really have a competition of ideas going on at the moment. I feel like we've got a lot of decisions being made by a handful of few and a majority are unelected that are making these calls. We've got an incredible opportunity, as Mark alluded to, with the technological disruption that's going on at the moment to actually be able to utilise a platform like what America do. I don't know if you've seen challenge.gov. They've got a government site where they literally put up public sector problems. They put a closed time period on them, one to two months. They put prizes attached to them to incentivise participation. And they crowdsource ideas from their citizenry onto how they should tackle public sector problems. You know, when I spent time in Washington a year or two ago with the people who, who found that, and they were telling me an example of a medical technology that a student with an anthropology master's had solved. And it's an example of, I think, how in the knowledge economy, it's shifting the paradigm and who can solve problems, who can, uh, I guess, take advantage of opportunities. And the fact is we're not engaging with that right now. Uh, do you think, just specifically speaking on behalf, as you are here tonight, of young people, yeah. do you think that there is a complete or a strong disengagement uh, that you're seeing that could be addressed in this way? Absolutely. I think, you know, we're seeing engagement. I'm fortunate enough to head the Y20 this year, and we're seeing engagement from levels of government internationally and domestically. But in terms of engaging broadly with young people, we had 400,000 young people last year who didn't choose to enrol to vote in the election. We're seeing an enormous level of disillusionment with levels of government. And really, that's coming from this sentiment that government doesn't represent me and speak for me. And I think anything that we can do to enhance the channels through which young people can contribute into the conversation, the better. Eva Cox. I think it's a really difficult problem because I think part of our problem at the moment is that the people that happen to be in government at the moment really don't represent the views of the population. I think people are becoming more and more alienated from both major political parties because they've moved, in a sense, to the point where I think it was the Lowy Institute, the young people said they couldn't tell the difference between the two major parties. I mean, I went to hear Malcolm Fraser the other day talking to a whole nest of left-wingers at a pub and he was sort of sitting there and everybody said, you know, how have you come? You've changed your mind. He said, I haven't changed my mind. I'm still more or less where I was, but all of them have moved to the right of me. And I thought that's actually a fairly good description of what's happened. We've had two... We've got also two an interesting notion that uh, left-wingers live in nests these days. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the problem is that, you know, that we actually... The, both political parties have sort of, in a sense, lost the image mm. of where we can go. We've lost the idea we don't talk about progress anymore. We don't talk about the good society. We don't talk about the common good. We talk about economic growth. And quite frankly, I think the fact that there's been such an emphasis on the economic stuff has, in a sense, disillusioned a lot of people because it can become very yeah. boring if everything's <laughs> always taken down to dollar values. And I just think people have begun to switch off of politics. I mean, what we need to do is engage people in trying to... I mean, I'd like to see us setting up social goals. I keep saying we live in a society, not an economy. Let's set social goals, not economic goals. I mean, GDP is there to serve what we want. It's not there as the primary goal. And maybe if we stop talking economics and start talking a society and start talking about where we want to live and relationships and who we are and what we like and what we feel and all of those things as part of the whole political process, maybe we'll get back to the fact that people can feel engaged. But at the moment, I just think they switch off because it's boring. Let's uh, go to a former politician. <laughs> I think the starting point is to be honest about the situation. Uh, those of us here in the studio tonight, uh, people watching at home, are part of the minority in this country, uh, maintaining some residual interest in party political debates. Uh, at the end of uh, 23 years of continuous economic growth in this country, the greatest wealth creation period in the nation's history, uh, the average Australian has become very self-reliant, uh, less need for government, less interest in government, and less interest in party politics, and this is part of the disengagement. I think if you ask the average citizen what they want, they'd say less partisanship, less squabbling, 
more independent professional decision making. And uh, one of the great success stories in this country um, over the 23 year period has been a policy model along those lines with the Reserve Bank of Australia independently, professionally setting offic official interest rates. And uh, I think there must be scope to extend that model to other contentious areas of public policy. Uh, the most important long-term issue for the country is climate change, for, for the planet, is climate change, but it's the worst level of political debate. Surely there's room at some point, uh, perhaps under a Turnbull-led Liberal Party, to have an <laughs> agreement about an independent <laughs> policy-making authority to look after these contentious issues. Take out the partisanship, take out the scare campaigns, take out the low-level party yeah. politics. And so too in framing the budget. Uh, Tony's been involved in this, but the budget debate in this country is just horrible. Uh, again, full of scare campaigns and political opportunism. You could use a model in macroeconomics similar to what we've got with the Reserve Bank uh, in monetary policy. Well, so I mean, Tony might argue quite right, the Audit Commission should have set the budget. Um, now, would they you have been happy with that? <laughs> well, yeah. I think you could have, you could have a but look, oh, yeah, but look, I, I've got to say, I mean, previous governments have set up, and the past government included, 930 bodies at the Commonwealth level to give advice on various things. So many of them, I think they lost their way. So you have a plethora of unelected bodies providing expert advice to government. But Mark is not talking about that. He's talking about uh, a, a, a non-elected body yeah. where the to power make the to make yeah. the policy well, is delegated, well, yeah. as with the Reserve Bank on monetary yeah, policy. I'm, I'd be nervous about that. I'm mm. nervous about unelected people making decisions which I impact on our I think I finally found lives. a point of agreement with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, I've made a mistake. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Actually, we've just got a young lady with a hand up here. We'll quickly go to you. Question yeah. or comment? Mark Latham. You were once a political head kicker and numbers man for the Labor Party, with Bill Shorten once describing you as having all the attributes of a dog except loyalty. <laughs> <laughs> well. Given that many young Labor members view your current criticisms as sour grapes of a jilted lover, as a man who's been rejected by the Labor Party, do you really see yourself in a position best placed to criticise Labor's current reforms? as you were once part of the flawed political well, labour machine. Well, uh, you, you need to more frequently read the Australian Financial Review, of course. Uh, <laughs> no, I do. That's fine, you do. Well, you would have seen my column backing in Bill Shorten's proposed Labour Party reforms as the most significant uh, for a generation or more. So um, I made the point, uh, I suppose, most notably in my diaries, a book that uh, Tony knows well, that uh, Labour was too factional uh, too many warlords, uh, yep. too much uh, trade union warlord influence and not enough participation within the party. And for whatever sins you've outlined about me and descriptions which you can take or leave, uh, you'd have to say that that analysis set out in yep. the Latham Diaries ten years later looks pretty solid mm -hmm. and the, the party has moved, the conventional wisdom inside the Labor Party has moved in the direction of the reforms that I spoke about. So, um, you know, I don't think that's a bad thing. I'm not claiming to be, uh, you know, delivering tablets here from the Mount. Or the Labor Party's think... Malcolm Fraser, either. No, well, I'm not, no, no, none of those things. But I, I think the points I made uh, systematically in that book, and have been making ever since, stack up, they're valid. Uh, they're the correct direction for the Labor Party, and I'd anticipate ten years from now it's will be, it will be where the Labor Party gets to. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not, not going to bog us that, down in uh, partisan politics here. No, but that, it is important for our democracy, though. It is important that you have a strong opposition. We yeah, but you actually, but you actually need an opposition. I you mean, do. in this funny sort of yeah. way that we've actually lost the idea mm. that we actually have two parties mm -hmm. that present clear opportunities mm -hmm. for people. Mm. And part of that is that you've got apparatchiks who don't know how to read an opinion poll, don't know, understand about how to do research, and think what you're doing is selling things. We've got Woolworths and Coles giving us a sort of a, 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 an election screed which says, Psst, vote for us and we'll give you more tax cuts. Psst, vote for us and we'll give you more of this. We do not have any of them sort of providing a sense of of leadership and difference in the way that once you had it with a sort of a left and a right, whether those were the appropriate divisions. And I just think that people have actually started switching off because it is very unclear. I mean, in social policies, I can name you the whole well, one. I'm not going to... Let's go. I'm going to pause you there for a mm. moment, if I can, because we'll come back to some of those yeah, issues. But, but, I just, uh, but I just think but it is important to recognise that part of the problem is that the actual nature of the sort of people that are going into okay. Parliament and the decision-making has changed dramatically. Thanks, Eva. Now, Mark Latham did make the point about the politics surrounding climate change, whether you can deal with that. Our next question is really about that subject. It's from Grant Johnson. Good evening, panel. 
It seems that the repeal of the carbon tax is imminent with the change of the Senate on July 1. I'm pleased about this, not because I don't believe in climate change, but because I consider that the political argument wasn't gained sufficiently before the introduction of a carbon tax that was probably the world's leading carbon tax for a country that only produces 1.5% of global emissions. So my question to our panel is, given that this whole process has been littered with political errors, in terms of creating a situation where we can introduce future big ideas for the nation, what can be learned from the whole carbon tax saga? Mark Latham. Uh, that modern politics doesn't handle big issues very well. And we've now got to the point, effectively, of policy gridlock, where you can't expect uh, an opposition party like Labor to put forward um, carbon pricing uh, at the next election for fear of Tony Abbott's scare campaign. Uh, I mean, Abbott on this has been so shockingly opp opportunistic. At one point he was supporting a carbon tax and, and then he was ranting and raving around the country for two years saying it was going to destroy the economy. And of course it did no such thing. So you, you've really got to the point of gridlock now. That's why I say that uh, you have to think about alternative mechaniz mechanisms of policy making uh, that are independent, that are uh, non-partisan. But you see the problem there is as soon as an independent body set a carbon tax or a carbon price mm. that the opposition at the time mm. disagreed with, you'd be back into the, this whole sort of argument about uh, this independent body and whether they should remain there. Well, I, I think it's your best mm. hope. Um, mm. You need to recognise there was a time in late 2009 where within the coalition it was just a couple of votes in that Liberal leadership ballot that Abbott beat Turnbull. So you could get cross-party agreement to take the politics out. That's the first step for both sides to acknowledge that really you won't get much done in this area if you open it up to political scare campaigns. Um, the Reserve Bank model for monetary policy has been phenomenally successful in this country. And, and Australians now have got accustomed to the idea this is how it's done. Mm. So it can be applied in other areas of policy. It's a terrible shame that the biggest issue has got the lowest level of debate and, and, and decision-making in this country. And, um, uh, you need to think outside the square to find a solution. Right. Because no, otherwise, no, no, no. Tony Shepard wanted gridlock. to get in there, so I'm uh, going to go okay. to him and we'll go to the well, other side of the panel. Well, I, I think Grant has uh, nailed it. I mean, he said we're 1.5% of the world's carbon dioxide. I mean, we halve it. It makes no difference. We're a rounding error. We've plunged into a carbon tax. we plunged into a REIT scheme. Cost of energy went up. We got hit with the GFC. The Mate. dollar went through the roof. Our manufacturing business... We, we cut our carbon. Yeah, we cut our carbon output really dramatically. But it was the GFC and the high Aussie dollar and the high energy prices that did it. We shouldn't have been the world leader, the first in. We should have followed the rest of the world and we should have been using our political power and dipl diplomacy to push the rest of the world down pricing carbon and take it up with the rest of the world. Don't be the world leader when you're a carbon-intensive country producing a minuscule amount of carbon compared to the rest yeah, of the world. By that argument, nobody would do anything. Yeah. Well, so, oh, that would no, be great. No, nobody, oh, well, they, that just makes the point. No, yeah, that would be great. Just, if, well, great in Australian yeah, context. But, but if that's your starting point that nobody in the world does anything, why do you give us a lecture? Why do you give us a lecture about the policy area? Okay, why don't you just declare just, just, uh, that nobody should care about it? No, 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 doesn't no, matter. No, I agree. No, we I, can have an all-night debate between you two. I'm going to pause you again. I want to actually hear from this side. Mark Carnegie wanted to jump in earlier. Tiny. Are you really going to tell your grandchildren that we should not have, have, as a nation, bought an intergenerational insurance policy about climate change? Let's debate the nature and extent of that. Okay. It is one of the most prosperous countries in the world, one of the biggest coal exporters, one of the richest countries on the world. We couldn't have been a thought leader. We couldn't have been an exemplar. When Exxon has said they back a carbon tax when Henry Paulson comes out today and backs a carbon tax. I'm going to have to look at my grandchildren and say we fiddled while Rome burnt. Well, look, what we should do is use, use our position, use our power to push the rest of the world along that path. We, did. Did. we stood up, we stood up ahead of everyone we else and said we are going to lead the world and introduce a carbon tax. And then the biggest oil and gas company in America has said that's the most rational policy. The guy who headed 
the US Federal Reserve has come out today and said that's a rational policy. And that's the month we're going to go and repeal and this. The extent of it and the pricing and everything, I get to that. Yeah, and, and you how are outsource gonna that? I wouldn't outsource but that. But but then, I'm not trying to do that. I'm just mm. trying to sit there and say, should the grown-ups and the children mm. of Australia sit there and say, at a time like this, we should mm. be having an adult discussion about the nature Absolutely. and extent and of what we're going to do discussion? for our children. No, we're not. We're, not. <laughs> we're, we're having, having that discussion. Anarchy. We're talking about what, at what rate we do it and what price we we're pay. We're not having direct no, but action, Hang on, hang on. You know, you, you, you've just contradicted yourself. We said you're, we're only one and a quarter percent of all pollutants. 1.8%. One, 1. OK. Well, what, in that case, why should anybody bother to listen to us if we can't set an example? Well, that's a we're good point. We're also one of the highest, highest actually polluters per capita. Because we we've got a carbon intense economy, and I'm not ashamed of that. Okay, In fact, well, we've we've benefited from that. We this might have been benefited by it. And how, how, much powerful... longer, how much longer are you going to rip it off and assume? Well, we're that not could... benefiting from it now. That's for sure. Uh, can I just it. can I just interrupt to <laughs> here from the next generation? Uh, because it's true to say um, we heard about what grandchildren will inherit. Well, mm. that's also children and your children, presumably, mm. Holly. Absolutely. I mean, this issue is absolutely central to the, well where the nation needs to move. And I think Ooh. one of the challenges with um, the, the model that we've got of how, okay, we, we have clearly identified with what's happened in the last couple of years is that we don't have a system that's designed to deal very well with intergenerational issues. And the challenge is more and more of them are sitting on our plate. Mm. Climate change is the case in point here and now. But my concern about moving to an independent body is, is getting that legitimacy. I mean, the thing that worked so well with the RBA was it was bipartisan. I mean, if we tried to oppose something like that now, the legitimacy and the will behind it, I think, would be lacking to do it. But we've clearly identified that something more needs to be done because this issue is continuing to be political points scored back and forth and we're not progressing ahead with something that's impacting on each and every one of us and the generations uh, that lie after us. Yeah, uh, Tony, do you accept that only bipartisanship <coughs> Uh, oh, will absolutely. be able to deal with I this agree. issue. I agree. I think one of the things that I do agree with, with Mark on and, and with Eva on and, to, and Mark Latham as well is that our ability to get bipartisanship on these big issues seems to be diminishing. Mm. And this has been a, a, evolved over the last 10 years or so, and I'm not sure of the underlying causes. But isn't it, is it entirely related to political leadership, isn't it? No, I mean, uh, it was, wasn't. Media, mate. Sorry? Yeah, part I, of it's I think part of it's the media, is this polarisation that you get in mm. the media, which means people are forced into positions. But well, in the point, past, we've point, had. Can I point out that we're a couple of the areas where we've got bipartisanship are some of the nastiest areas of policy we've got? I mean, have a look at, at uh, boat people. We've got absolute bipartisanship and we have a reputation at the moment as being one of the nastiest countries in the world. Bipartisanship in itself is not necessarily wise and not necessarily something we want to actually follow. Well, yeah. either, either that bipartisanship is stopping young families from drowning on the seas between yes, Australia and, if and Indonesia. Actually, yeah. And if you think thousands of people drowning off our, off our borders... Yeah, a good oh, solution. stop, is, stop is, it, Mark. Is that, 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 this is the most, this is the most crappy I'm, argument. I'm afraid I'm, you're very, very I'm bad. Sorry, if we'd have started Very bringing people deluded. in from Malaysia and we'd have started bringing people in from Indonesia, if we'd have competed, the way you stop boat, uh, the uh, people smugglers is by offering to get people into the country, not by stopping them. OK, Eva, Eva this is a very well-rehearsed argument. Let's move along. You're watching a special edition of Q&A. We're trying to rise above partisan politics. Uh, <laughs> we're trying to answer the big questions. The next one comes from Nicole Williamson. I'm picking up a little bit, I think, from what Holly started to talk about, um, and that is new ways of looking at government and, and decision making. Um, in the emerging tech uh, startup world in Australia, um, the ethos is um, think big, start small, fail fast, adapt, and keep moving forward. Does the panel think that this approach is something that we could trial in Australia, or is media scrutiny and risk averseness going to make that impossible? Well, Holly, she started with you. Do you want to? Yeah, absolutely. That? I, look, I would. It sounds love... like a business model. It, it does sound a bit like a business model, but I think one of the big things we definitely need to address is the appetite for risk. Um, I, I find it really interesting that we're not prepared and we don't have the courage to pilot new ideas to give things a grow and to, to be able to have the conversation that we tried and maybe it didn't turn out but here's the things we learned and here's the way that we're better for having done that experiment. It seems a little bit at the moment and this is this is not um, aimed at either party, I think it's consistent across the last couple of years that if it's not splashed over the front page of a newspaper then maybe let's keep investing in it because it's not creating any furor or any like challenges but that doesn't mean we're innovating and we're pushing the dial and we're moving things in the direction that we need them 
to to be able to advance and, and keep pace with what's going on. So 100% support a greater appetite for piloting, for experimenting and for adapting um, and adopting more of that risk aversion and innovation that we're seeing in the tech startup world. Yeah, I'd, Tony. I'd agree. I agree. I, I was disappointed. The Commission was disappointed just at the federal level, the lack of embrace of you know, e-government, yeah, the cloud. I mean, just fundamental things that we were all starting to take for granted in, at the Commonwealth level have been very, very slow adopters. Very slow adopters. And I, 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 I'm at a loss to explain that. It just seems to be strange. But there is a gap and a significant part of our report was dedicated to that. It hasn't got any coverage. Because well, in, general, in general terms, the question was also seen to be addressing the ideas of business being applicable to... Um, making policy work or uh, using business notions. Tony, it's not business notions. It's the fact that the world has changed mm -hmm. as a result of using technology as an enabler. And that means the whole world's changed. Inventions mm -hmm. have changed. Social engagement's yeah. changed. Mm -hmm. The way people actually yeah, do things have changed. But the problem is government hasn't changed. Changed no, with it. No, human no, services no. still deals with 50% of their people in hard copy. Yeah. Taxation still sends out 12 million letters a year because they have to do it in hard copy. And I mean, that this makes is just ridiculous. And then when you go to a government outfit and you say, this is, this is a great program here, you've been running yeah. for 10 years, what's the result? I'm sorry we don't have the data. I mean, it, well, you can't tell whether it's working or not. Oh, the data's there, but we can't collect yeah. it. And, and there's structural that's... rigidities around e-health e yeah. records and all sorts Absolutely. of things. You've got billions of dollars a year on the table here at the moment. Uh, billions. Available. Billions. And so our sense is, look, let's try, after a week of starting this argument, let's just run one of these things, mm. like we do them for business all the time. Mm. We've got social policy mm. ones out. Let's try one and just see. see and as I say, well, the me, government's... Let, you me know, go, let, me go, let me go back, let me go back to our uh, questioner. Uh, Nicole had a hand up. Uh, uh, so do you have any specific notions in mind? Well, my... I've got a, a, something else that big business is starting to do with the startup community. It was picking mm. up on the data point. Mm. Mm. Is a starting to... A big business is starting to clean up its data a little bit and opening it up to startups mm -hmm. to play with in, in mm. what they call hackathons. Mm. Mm. Um, to me, that is just the most fantastic yeah. way that um, government could uh, apply that sort of innovative um, thinking uh, to, to try new ways of, of, of looking at the data that's available. Let's go. How, how would that work? In I don't know, mate. The truth <laughs> of the matter is the things you know from the lean startup is yeah. fail small, fail fast, mm. split test, try some stuff, don't be embarrassed that nine, no. what they call the stochastics. 99 out of 100 things are going to fail and you're yeah. going to get one that works, etc. Can you, can you really... Are you talking, I don't know. Talking, We're going to try and we'll see. But in terms of uh, Turn up government, and see. government policy, how would that actually we don't work? Know. Let's just go out and see what people have got out there, run one of these things and see so what we goes. got. And yeah. we'll just see. You know, what I can tell you for sitting at Infrastructure... New South Wales is there was a ton more smart ideas in the room than there were ones that were going to get adopted by mm. government. I got no idea whether this is going to work, but the whole point about business at the moment is try it, fail well, fast, and see what happens. It can't be worse than the status quo. Eva? Where's business? I mean, if business is so bloody good at doing these things, why do we... you can't do this, Eva. Hang on, I'm not talking... Yeah, but there's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of things that people come out and they say there's stuff going on at universities, there's ideas, there's new inventions, there's new discoveries, there's various other things. Australian business won't pick them up. Australian business is not particularly fast on its feet. It's not particularly innovative. And maybe they've got to also have a look at why they're not Mate, being all that smart. it's Usain Bolt compared to the government. <laughs> <laughs> I was just... Yeah, we had a question with a... <laughs> Go ahead. Put your comment. Go ahead. Uh, just uh, on the point of uh, innovation, do you think that the tendency for ministers to want to be personally involved in, in projects and, and be the ribbon cutter is getting in the way of the frontline public service delivery? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's a big risk. Yeah. What do you I think? I mean, Mark, a hero Mark project's Latham. what you want. I want to Sorry. hear from Mark Latham yeah, on this as well. You've actually been... Oh, to some extent, of course. Uh, ministers like good publicity. They like opportunities to show their wares in public. But in terms of this innovation debate, I got a bit lost after the point of emails versus letters. Uh, maybe I'm too much of a Luddite <laughs> in this. The, the thing that strikes me about the, the, the political system and, and, and where we're plagued by uh, gridlock, really, is there, there are probably five big issues where the nation is not making sufficient progress. We've mentioned climate change, we've mentioned distrust in the political system itself, 
Uh, you could add to that uh, poverty alleviation, mm. particularly in Indigenous communities. You could add to that the education reform debate, which is a terrible black mm. hole in Australia. And you could add to that the economic flexibility debate, that if the uh, China investment boom comes off and goes bad for, uh, for our resource industries, then obviously economic flexibility in Australia becomes paramount. So these are five big issues where you could fairly well say over the last 10, 15 years, they've been on the agenda, they're so big and important, the political system hasn't been able to resolve them and make any progress. So I'm not so much worried about the next uh, generation of innovation uh, in the public sector, I'm more worried about solving these big things that have been sitting on the plate for the last decade or so. OK, let's keep I'm moving on, because uh, we've got a, quite a few issues to get to. I'm sorry to those who had their hands up uh, during that. Um, uh, there's also the issue of how individuals can respond to making the society better. And the next question is about that. It's from Thomas Van Leeuwen. <clears throat> uh, yes, my question is directed at Mark Carnegie. Uh, next week I'll be going to Gallipoli, uh, making the pilgrimage, and I wanted to ask more about your, your uh, wisdom transfer theory. You say you want young Australians to re-engage with democracy, um, but I wanted to see what kind of activities, how you would do this. So what kind of activities that would be and what the penalties would be. So you've got two different things, which is why do I think there needs to be compulsion around civic service is one idea. And then of the four ideas for what you use civic service for, one of which is this wisdom transfer idea, I've got some specifics around that. If I can take the second question first, wisdom transfer is just purely and simply as this, which is, it's meant to be my business to be in the technology business. I can't make my DVD work, right? <laughs> what it must be like for the average 60-year-old person to try and deal with the rate of change of technology at the moment, I can only imagine. And yet, I watch the younger people in the community and how they take to technology like a duck to water. To my mind, that's wisdom of young people that old people would benefit from as they feel increasingly alienated. And some amount of actually getting them to engage with old people is really important. On the other hand, what I find so fascinating is that when I talk to young people, the number of them that don't know about Simpson and his donkey, one of the foundation myths of Australia with all of the complexity of history, absolutely stuns me. So the people who built the great nation of Australia, who were part of it, are sitting there feeling increasingly alienated and find some way to actually be able to have them engage with young people, talk about the story of what's made Australia one of the greatest countries in the world. I think there's a lot of really wonderful things that can get done then. Then to the second part of your question... Yes, which let's is, go to that. It's, this, this is the week. idea of compulsory <laughs> civil... Volunteerism. ..service, compulsory civil service. So, conscription, in yeah, fact. Absolutely. And so, my point about it is, you know, as I said to Di Gribble, whose name I, you know, was used in the Di Gribble argument so many times, you know, for you old 60s lefties, asking everybody to get, get, get together, hold hands and sing Kumbaya <laughs> is going to achieve absolutely nothing, right? What we all want is universality. What we all want is an understanding that carrying an Australian passport means more than rights, it means obligations. We are one of the few countries in the world with compulsory voting. We don't need a big sanction and a big penalty to actually get people to participate far more in Australian democracy than anything else. But the idea that you could actually sit there and say, we're going to be a world leader in democracy. We're going to get people more engaged. I think just the mere fact that you understood living in one of the great countries in the world involved obligations and not just rights was going to be a big and important thing. But you're, let's get this straight, you're not just talking about young people, are you? You're no, talking about everybody across every age group, I, well, as I said, I spoke to children and sick ab people. Yeah, absolutely. What I said was, I spoke to a lot of people about more civic engagement, and the truth was everybody said, that's a really good idea, but I'm too busy. Another guy should do it. And another guy, and another guy. Then I went to the phone book. There ain't that many other guys, Tony. <laughs> What should they be doing? What, what is it you're actually wanting them to do? If, so if, if you're able to, this, to run a system like this... So what I'm saying is, lean startup, split test, let's try some things. There are four broad areas of this. One is volunteerism. That's a really important component of building 
social capital. But, but if we can find some compulsory volunteerism. Yeah, it's a start no, so the whole point about it is, I don't know how you feel when you're a stone overweight and trying to get fit again. The answer is, for me, I need some compulsion, some reason to get out of bed at six o'clock and start getting fit for summer again. The whole point about this is, do it for some amount. What you find is, people come and go, that wasn't quite so bad, there were parts of it that were enjoyment. You get a habit of engagement and do something about it. So that was one particular part. You want me to go on? Well, no, no, no but <laughs> well, well, I do. Before, I, everyone wants to get involved, but first yeah. of all, you should just tell us what people would be doing. So it's one of four things. Volunteerism is mm. one thing. The second thing is this old and young wisdom transfer is the second. The direct democracy, the Susskind stuff out of Stanford was the third. And the fourth one is this idea of Kickstarter engagement in actually small local I issues, you know of different types that affect the community to try and get the huge majority, the silent majority of Australians who are currently disengaged from politics, sitting for long enough to actually think about these issues, work them through. Okay, now yeah. that's the debate, so we're gonna have it in a second, but there's a question from the floor, go ahead. Um, I'm involved in a Rotary Club uh, and volunteer, so I'm not compelled to do it. And I hang with a lot of 60-year-olds, showing them how to use their computers. <laughs> but for, for your idea <laughs> is how, you know, in the, in the generation is what's in it for me. If you're compelling people to volunteer and show, you know, mentorship and stuff, what's the, the um, uptake? Do we get, by participating in this uh, community credit, do we get, you know, a we source of income? We get to keep the great country we've got, which I feel is beginning to fray at the edges as a result of this social disengagement. And I think willing a better society with, without some form of universality is going to be impossible. And the problem is universality without compulsion just isn't going to happen because everybody's going to leave it to people, you know, the other guy. OK, oh, so everyone wants yeah. to get involved. So uh, <laughs> I was hoping so. That's yeah, the no, that's point exactly, of the argument. exactly right. Eva, go ahead. I mean, I'm being quoted. This is this is the first the fir my first Boyer lectures about 20 years ago when I started talking about this, which was put up online by the ABC. So I assume you're not breaching your own copyright. It's up there if you look in the Twitter sphere. I mean, this is one of the ideas I talked about. But what I was talking about was the idea that you need to engage. We've got I think you know with the idea of trust that what we have to have is trust and trustworthiness. And what we've had for the last 20 years is a trust deficit. This is what we've been talking about. People become less and less engaged with things because they don't trust the system, they don't trust the politicians, they don't trust other people. There's a question people ask, you know, do you trust most other people or most other people are around to rip us off? It keeps going down. Trust of politicians is way down. If you don't build trust, if you don't have a situation, and inequality, incidentally, is a really big poison of trust, and everybody in Australia, or large numbers of people, think we're becoming more unequal. We're destroying that particular image you've got of the great country. But if you don't actually voluntarily allow people to feel that they're part of something, if they don't feel engaged with it, if they don't engage with it because they feel they're part of it, you're not going to get it by compelling them to do it. You're just going to get resentment. You're going to get the people who have least investment in it feeling most angry about the fact but people that don't resent put. compulsory voting. That, that's an interesting uh, mm. dichotomy. Yeah, what do you think, Holly? Yes, they do. Yeah. <laughs> Some people do. <laughs> Libertarians <laughs> do. Yeah. But I mean, I just can, can I just finish this off yeah. because I think what's really important is that we actually do something about the trust deficit. And compelling people into doing things, I think, will undermine that even more so. I agree with the idea we need more engagement, but we need voluntary engagement. People need to do it because they want to do it. Mm. They need to do it because they feel that they, ha you know, that they have an obligation to do it. They're not going to do it if you say, next week you're going to go and pull up the weeds down at so-and-so's garden. We, we as a country are good at volunteering. I mean, if you, yeah, if, you give, high, yeah. if you give Australians a problem to solve which requires volunteers, you'll get swamped. Whether it be a bushfire, a flood, uh, some other form of disaster, an Olympic Games, you give them the opportunity, clean up the harbour, they'll come. So it's really, I mean, you, you can't make it compulsory because that's a contradiction in terms mm. of compulsory volunteering. <laughs> and, and also, I mean, I must say from the Commission of Orders point of view, that would yet be another Commonwealth Department. Before you could blink it, have 10,000 public servants. We'd have, you know, the but volunteer mate, police. Audit, I didn't see I'm much. Paid public no, service. But mate, I, in your audit, I didn't see much about what we're going to do about social capital. No, well, no. look, uh, look, we did have something about the role of government. I, I think that 23 years of, un, you know, of sustained growth, people have actually 
lost the concept of what it means to be a citizen and put mm. back. And I, I think that might be an educational problem. It might be something that the media's got to stress more. But I think we've lost sight of the obligations of being a citizen. And it's all about what can I get from government, not about what I can put back into society. But and I think that is one of our biggest dangers agree at the moment. Actually, and it comes yeah, from yeah. affluence, not from... Uh, not it from sounds, in fact, it sounds like you're agreeing with Mark Carnegie, but you have a different solution. Yeah. I do. Mm. What's I your do. solution? Well, uh, my solution is encouraging volunteerism mm. and encouraging society, and particularly young people to under, and older people as well, because they're big takers, that you actually have to contribute to society. The m true meaning of being a citizen, I think, is being lost. Um, yeah. Holly, um, do, you, do you think that is true of young people? Well, I want to take issue with uh, calling young people big takers. I think um, we actually have a very active population of young people in terms of their engagement with civic participation in this country. I mean, we saw the rates of youth volunteering double in the 15 years to 2006, and it's only getting more active since then. Um, but I think it's really important that we do facilitate greater opportunities for that engagement and build that into the way that we're structuring, you know, particularly, I think, a great opportunity is provided through schools and universities. Um, you know, I was part of writing a submission for the national curriculum with leaders from Western Australia about how we could look at cre creating the civics and the citizenship part of the, the conversation and the curricula that we have in primary schools and secondary schools in particular and expanding that to involve active citizenship and yeah. embedding volunteering and opportunities in that. But, I mean, interestingly, we, we piloted this basically in Western Australia a couple of years ago. 2009, we implemented compulsory mm. 20 hours community service across the final three years of high school. It lasted two years before it collapsed because of the resourcing um, provided to schools to actually implement it. So I think one of the conversations we need to have before we go further down this line is what does it look like to actually roll this out? Because I think it, we actually go backwards if we initiate and then we repeal it back. Mark Latham. Uh, well, I think, I think it's a situation with cross-currents. Um, there, uh, because of, of greater self-reliance, higher levels of education in Australia, uh, people are less trusting of big institutions, less trusting of big media, big politics, uh, big churches, big business, because they've got the power and information access to make more of the decisions in their lives themselves. And I think that's a good thing. It so is. there's a cross-current, there's a positive thing, but it does diminish trust of a certain kind. Doesn't it also mean that they're going to withdraw to their own little castles? Yes. Uh, well, in, that, that, in, that is a, that is a trend. Um, mm -hmm. Andrew Lee, uh, the, the, the Federal Labor member, produced a very good book, A Study of Civic Participation in Australia Since World War II, and he showed a, a long-term mm -hmm. decline yeah. in, in participation. So I think everyone there's on the panel... a long-term decline in, in joining organisations, yes. Yes. not yes. necessarily in volunteering in itself. Well, no, that too, and... So, and, and and knowing your neighbours and trusting in your yeah, neighbours and, I know, and but I would visiting also, your neighbours. But I would also suggest um, the lack of trust is actually because people have actually... because we've become more unequal and people have become more anxious about things. I don't think it's the confidence that people can manage things on their own. Well, Mark is making the opposite point of view. Well, He's yeah. saying that yeah, yeah. Uh, we're yeah. more affluent and we're more self-reliant. Exactly. So well, that's, I'm, that's I'm, the opposite I'm, argument. There's still a role for being a society and rebuilding social yeah. capital. I, I, I think, think, I, I think I'm arguing that I don't think that's actually true, but I think people are more anxious that that actually undermines the social capital. But I, I agree with Ollie, it comes from the education. This is really something that you have to... This is a core value that you need to embed in our education mm. So why do you want to make it so much more expensive? I don't. <laughs> I want to make it more effective. <laughs> expensive doesn't necessarily mean better results, and we've shown that pretty much in the last ten years. Tony, well, if, if you have to live with the debt, it might be, you might have a different view. Yeah. Yeah. Could I just suggest, <laughs> instead of compulsion, an alternative approach, which is about encouragement and incentives? Mm -hmm. I think the best role for government, for instance, is provide a, a discount on HEX yeah. for university students who participate in local community groups yeah. uh, and help out. Um, yeah. uh, I think uh, also uh, that uh, uh, lavish uh, government funding of uh, very affluent private schools uh, should have attached to it a requirement to qualify for the funding. They go out and provide mentoring and assistance for disadvantaged schools, building bridges across economic uh, barriers and classes and uh, helping uh, people in need. That would be a very good requirement as well, and they might could find... Could be very patronising. <laughs> well, um, it, it could be very useful in bringing people together across uh, socio Many private boundaries. schools do that already. So, well, they do, but some don't, and uh, some should certainly do a lot more. So I think there are clever ways in which government can leverage greater uh, community participation and social capital without going down the path of... Well, there's at least uh, one yeah. of those that you've got a huge round of applause for. But let's move on. Uh, you're watching Q&A. Our next question has actually been chosen 
chosen by the Twitter audience. It's a video. It comes from John Tate in Airport West, Victoria. Every time a new poll comes out, I analyse the data and I'm always amazed that the under 25 age group thinks quite differently to the other age groups. I wonder how well represented they are by the current political parties. So, do you think there could be a place for a new party that would represent the viewpoints of this important section of society? Holly, let's start with you. Yeah, good question. Uh, you know, are we represented? I mean, the, the pretty obvious question if we're talking purely in terms of are there under 25s in Parliament is I think we can say no to that. I believe all our mm -hmm. MPs, perhaps White Roy is still under uh, the, the age of 25. I'm not actually sure. But in terms of the representation, I mean, if we take it globally, 50% of the world's population are under 27 now. So we're an enormous demographic. Are we represented according to our weight and stature in a demographic sense in Parliament? No, we're not. So yeah, there's definitely a space, should there be a party that could emerge that could galvanise the views and, and represent young people in that regard. But I think another part of this conversation goes back to the point that was raised in the question earlier around that intergenerational wisdom. I think it's not just about how do we create a youth party that represents the youth views. You know, for me, it's about how do we better engage young people across all decision making and actually create systems that allow that knowledge transfer to be a part of how we form policy, how we create better debate, how we drive greater quality of decision making, make it more robust. So for me, it, if you're kind of creating a party, it almost it pushes it to the periphery. It's like, oh, that's the, the party that speaks for young people. No, government should speak yeah. for young people too. Um, yeah. Mark, can I bring you back in? I mean, uh, you started this debate. It's gone, uh, it's gone through quite a few uh, different um, perambulations, but <laughs> now it's uh, reached a point where some concrete things are being discussed, including the idea of specific parties for young people. What do you think about all this? Well, I mean, to me, I'd go back to an earlier point that... Um, that Mark made about the idea of incentives, which obviously I'm all for, because fundamentally I'm a capitalist at heart, and I think they're far better than sanctions. And the truth is that across Australia, all of the youth that I've spoken to about this idea say, we're all for this. Mm -hmm. Some element of compulsion's all right, provided you loosen the noose of hex debt mm. around mm. our throat. That's the biggest thing they worry about the tyranny of a debt servitude like that. So finding some way to be able to do a give and a get <laughs> by getting youth engaged with some amount of capacity on the hex thing seems to me to be a perfectly reasonable argument from you. Let's just go back to Tony here. Had the Audit Commission thought along these lines or had that sort of uh, feedback coming into you, do you think you might have recommended to the government that they consider some way of relieving the hex debt by allowing... Well, if, if people were in return to give something back to the community. No, we didn't look at that. And it, no, but I'm asking you bad, to think it's about it. Bad, it's not a bad idea. I mean, our problem with higher education was, like a lot of other parts of the budget, it was growing faster than our GDP, faster than our revenue, and, you know, it was becoming unaffordable. So we, we did suggest deregulation well, of a couple of courses as an experiment because we were concerned about the possibility of a blowout in the cost. But we felt that kids going to uni compared to, say, kids doing other courses were getting, obviously, far higher earning potential and that they had the capacity to repay the debt over time. Holly, I you think, might want to address yeah, that? Yeah, I think that speaks to, uh, I guess, an issue where I see a greater opportunity for a conversation to have been had with the, the end recipients or the people who are ultimately going to be um, bearing the consequences of the decisions made. I mean, a, an extension of that, you know, I was in Paris earlier this year for a G20 uh, youth meeting. Um, we were talking about what was an employment task force meeting alongside three days of conferences on youth apprenticeships and youth guarantees. I was the only young person there for three days. You know, we've got a situation, take apprenticeships just in Australia, where only one in two people who start an apprenticeship are finishing it. You know, we've got a 50% completion rate. Um, but we're not actually having the people around the table who are ultimately going to be using, take this point, the education system, mm. to have that conversation around, hey, could we do a trade-off for hex debts or is there some way of working this? So if we deregulate, we're not creating this state of, you know, rising fees and, and greater unfairness. Have you thought about going into politics? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you make a good point, but the VET system in Australia has failed. I mean, when you've, mm, got, when you've got a third to a half of apprentices not completing and yep. on all the other VET courses, virtually the same failure to complete, despite the billions of dollars that have been put into this mm. tertiary education, 
the system is filing. Yeah. Well, I'll just go back to Mark Carnegie here because I heard him say when you were making that point earlier, that's an accounting argument. So, so around the world, study after study says that the more important, harder university disciplines return both for the participants and the state yeah. in the mid-teens yeah. returns. And last I checked, yeah. the government bond rate was 3.7%. The, on the government side, this is an absolutely amazing investment for the nation in the hard sciences, engineering, medicine and all of those things. The really, really expensive university courses to do. And my point is, I wouldn't have opened the hypothecation, um, you know, genie like the government did with the budget. But once you do that, the answer is, if you're willing to do that, then you can certainly fund an incremental 10, 20 or 30 billion dollars worth of higher education with social impact bonds once yeah. you've agreed to do that. And as I said, I read as much of, you know, the um, Commission of Audit as anybody and I didn't see any discussion of the social capital, the things that makes Australia rich in there, any of these broader things. Well, let's go back to Tony just to respond to that. I mean, did you miss a fundamental no, side so. of the investment I don't, I don't, I don't, the equation, bottom, the investment the government the is bottom, making? The bottom line is, you know, we do not have unlimited money. We do not have unlimited money. I mean, I, I don't know how many times we can say this. It's not the a magic pudding. It it's <clears> not a magic pudding. You eat from it, it's, it has to be replenished. So you have to cap something. Now, where do you cap? All right, it's not higher education. All right, we'll take it out of aged care. Or we'll take it out of carers, or we'll take it out of NDIS. There is not an unlimited amount of money. Well, hang so on. So people... Hang on a second. I mean, In the we're, intergenerational we're... report, 60% of the long-term, both of the intergenerational reports, 60 to 65% of the long-term budget imbalance is the fact that the unit increase in the price of healthcare, not the volume, per, per, but the price per person goes up at 5% real. That's 60% of the problem. St you know, hanging that around the youth of Australia that are going to be the people with a change dependence dependency ratio just seems to me I agree, setting totally. up a problem. We, we had something yeah. a lot to say about it. No, no, I know, mate. But you also, you also <laughs> keep banging on about cutting, and I know we were having a conversation in the Green Room. We've got $125 billion sitting there in tax expenditures, which primarily go to higher income males in varying t times of, uh, oh, of concessions. Oh, uh, It's true. <laughs> yeah, I know you prefer oh. to avoid it. But I mean, I, these I, are tax concessions, not tax you know, expenditures, which is the new term that I know describe it. We did recommend that a close review be had of tax I know, but you keep carrying on about cutting rather than looking at some of the... Well, you can do that. Well, can I you mean, let me finish? Because yeah. you've actually had quite a good go at the moment. <laughs> I'm, to think. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you. But yeah, well, I'm trying... Because I, what I'm trying to say is, first of all, I think we need to look at the idea that tax expenditures need to be put in it because that's money the government doesn't collect but it's still money that actually eventually comes out of the budget. But if you go back to the university stuff, first of all, people who earn more money pay more money in, in, in actual taxes, and that's one of the returns you get out of putting people through universities. Secondly, I think what you're doing, if you have a complete emphasis on the amount of money you earn, earn in universities, what happens to the people that take up the public uh, service jobs that are quite cheap, for instance, of, of working in uh, legal aid rather than being a corporate Eva, I'm lawyer. I'm told we've gone over time, mm -hmm. so can you just to quickly summarise your Well, point. I'm just saying that I think we actually always make the assumption that we've somehow got to punish people. We don't look at the fact that a lot of, a lot of workers who take low-paid jobs will not be able to take them if they've got to pay back large amounts of hex. And I think we ought to think about that as one of the bad things about trying to... I'm sorry to those people who've got well, their hands up. Well, 25 percent of them don't pay back anything at all, so... Well, yes. Well, you, uh, right. there was yeah. a suggestion you take it back from them after they're dead. Well, and, why not? Yeah. <laughs> why not? Why not? Because they've got money benefit. in their estate. Why yes. not? Because they can should, benefit. Why should somebody on eighty thousand a year, um, uh, paying fifteen, twenty grand tax, uh, uh, working hard, so, uh, subsidise somebody yeah, yeah, uh, right. to get a degree? Or why should they subsidise? What's the fairness? Because of they'll that? actually have a doctor or nurse that All might right. be able oh, to give, give them me a break. As you can see, as you can see, there are some problems we will never solve. That's all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Eva Cox, Mark Carnegie, Holly Ransom, Tony Shepherd, and Mark Latham. Thank you. Now, thank you very much.
Next Monday, Q&A will be live from Geelong, one of the region's hardest hit by job losses in manufacturing. But finding a new vision for jobs and industry isn't just a challenge for Geelong, it's a national issue affecting all of us. Joining the panel are three national politicians with strong connections to the region. The Liberal MP for Karangamite, Sarah Henderson. The Labor member for Karaya, Richard Miles. The Green Senator, Richard Di Natale. Plus, Elaine Carbines, the Chief Executive of the Geelong Regional Alliance. And the Mohawk Sporting Mayor of Greater Geelong, <laughs> Darren Lyons. Stay tuned for uh, Late Line and an interview with Peter Grester's brother, Andrew, in Cairo. Till next week, good night.